Hello and welcome to Sunday Politics. After seven years and £40 million, we now have the results of the official investigation into Steak Knife, the Army's top spy in the IRA. But are we left with more questions than answers about the dirty war that took place during the Troubles? We'll hear from two experts who've covered every twist and turn of the Freddy Scapatici story. What next for the government in the Republic as voters overwhelmingly vote against amending the Irish Constitution? As head of government and on behalf of the government, uh, we accept responsibility for the result. Uh, it was our responsibility to convince the majority of people to vote yes, um, and we clearly failed to do so. And with me throughout, offering his insight into those stories and more, the Irish News political correspondent John Manley. He cost more lives than he saved. That's the damning verdict of the Operation Canova report on the activities of the British agent Steak Knife. West Belfast man Freddy Scapatici was linked to 14 murders and 15 abductions during his time in the IRA. The report gives a list of 10 recommendations. One that the 21st of June, the longest day of the year, should be a day of remembrance for victims of the Troubles. Here's a flavour of some of what was said following the publication of the report on Friday. The claims about countless lives being saved by steak knife are inherently implausible and should have rung further alarm bells. Any serious security and intelligence professional hearing an agent being likened to the goose that laid the golden eggs, as steak knife was, should be on the alert, not, be not least because the comparison is rooted in fables and fairy tales. The United Kingdom government should apologise to the Canova families for the failures of the security forces to protect the lives of their loved ones, investigate the crimes committed against them and treat them with the fairness, compassion, respect and transparency that they deserved. The former Prime Minister Lord Cameron issued public apologies in the wake of the Bloody Sunday and Pat Finucane reports. In my view, the same thing should happen here. I'm not surprised at the information which is contained in this report, but that doesn't make it any less terrible. And, and for the families, I think today must be an enormously difficult day. But uh, I'm very, very glad because I can see that um, on this occasion, John Boucher got further than many others have got in terms of information retrieval out of some of the agencies who really can be very reluctant to give information. And of course, it, it, the, the fact that people refuse information can then lead to a whole lot of expensive legal challenges. I've said it before and I will repeat it again today for all those families out there that lost a loved one. I am sorry for every single loss of life and that is without exception. That's for every person who was hurt or impacted by our conflict and I think it's important that today as the Sinn Féin new generation, Good Friday Agreement generation leader, that I will repeat that for those families. And I hope, can only hope, because this is ultimately their day, that they can take some comfort from that. Well, I think the Republican leadership need to be very clear. There was always an alternative to this. Uh, they have to be clear that what happened was wrong. The murder and torture of uh, their own community uh, was absolutely wrong. There's one thing to say that we are sorry um, for all deaths. Of course we are sorry and everyone is sorry um, for all deaths. It's deeply regrettable, but that's very different from saying it was wrong. It should not have happened. There was always an alternative. It's now time for the Sinn Féin leadership to say that that campaign was wrong. It was immoral. It was futile. Uh, and should apologise for what happened, and particularly to the victims of um, that, that operation within the provision of IRA. Likewise, the British government should apologise in respect of the clear uh, presentation by the report that murder and deaths happened that could have been prevented, uh, given that the security forces had knowledge through agents that such uh, murders were about to happen. Michael Martin. So let's delve a bit deeper into the issues raised by Friday's report with my guests Alison Morris, the Belfast Telegraph security correspondent, and Judith Thompson, the former Victims Commissioner. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for joining us. Judith Thompson, you were involved in Canova in an advisory capacity as a member of the Victims Focus Group. Is this, in your view, a good report for victims? This is a very clear, unequivocal report for victims that tells them that much of what they believed was correct which tells them that what happened to them was wrong, should not have happened. 
and acknowledges the pain and the wrong that they suffered. So yes, this is an important report for victims, but it's only a part of the process. There will be individual reports to each family and a final report for the inquiry. So it's a first step in a really important process. What do you think they will make of those comments from John Boucher, who of course authored the report, now the Chief Constable of the PSNI, uh, demanding that the British government apologise to the uh, uh, families of um, involved in the Canova report, and that the crimes involved should be investigated, um, and that they should be shown the respect, he says, that they are um, owed? I, th I think, I believe for these families in particular, it's really fundamental. So the level of stigma, isolation and intimidation that these families were subjected to often within their own communities and by those who perpetrated those murders were, were stand out. Uh, it must have been the most terrible experience and a lifelong one for some people. So acknowledgement is right up there in terms of what they want to see happen. Um, some people want prosecutions, other people feel differently. But the, with the demand for truth and acknowledgement of the wrongness of it. So I think those are the really important messages which this report steps towards and apologies are clearly a part of that. Um, Alison, that, that is at the heart of Canova, isn't it? It is, as Judith has just said, for us, such a, such a complicated set uh, of transgressions on so many different levels. And to hear somebody like John Boucher saying what he said, who is an establishment figure, let's not forget now, as Chief Constable of the PSNI, it's very significant. Um, do you think it'll happen? I think that when the final report comes out, it'll be very hard for whoever the British government is at that time not to apologise. And as he said, there's a precedent for this. David Cameron did it, you know, to the, the family of Pafanuk and After Bloody Sunday. Um, I do think the issue with the convictions... Um, that was a sore point with some of the families because they did feel that there was enough evidence in their case for there to be a conviction. The PPS disagree. John Boucher seemed quite irate at that. You could almost actually feel his frustration coming out of the pages of Canova that he felt, had that been in England, those files would have made, made the test for prosecution had it been the Crown Prosecution Service there. Um, the, the test for prosecution here appears to be higher than it is. So if you talk about Canova and what it cost, okay, it's things 30, just over £38 million. Pounds. That's probably pretty similar to what the Billy Wright inquiry cost, the Robert Hamill inquiry cost, actually less than the Rosemary Nelson inquiry cost. Um, but it was important that those inquiries give those answers. If that was what, <clears throat> what Canova set out to do, well, it has, because I've seen um, some of the individual briefings of the reports the families have been given, and they are very, very detailed, and they answer questions that never would have been answered otherwise. If its purpose was to bring the people responsible for those murders and the people who handled them or mishandled them in this case, well then, no, it hasn't been value for money. But prosecutions, I think, we're now at the stage of our conflict and our legacy where we're pretty much beyond the criminal prosecution stage and we're now at the answers and reconciliation. And one of the individual briefings that the family of Anthony McKernan, who I spoke to this week, were given showed that not just one but two informers had told their handlers where he was being held in West Belfast and that he was to be murdered and no attempt was made to save him. The family always suspected that, but now they know that. Um we should just say, of course, that the Secretary of State has made it clear he's not commenting uh, at this stage on the interim findings because there's ongoing litigation in the courts. We'll see what happens when the when the um, the final report is published. On that issue, Judith, that Alison has just raised about the fact that there aren't going to be um, prosecutions, we now know that to be the case. There's truth and there's justice. Um, it may be that some families get more truth than they have had up to now, but how disappointed do you think they will be to know that they apparently are not going to get the justice that some of them were still seeking. I think that is disappointing, and I think that this report is very clear about that. The report says that there are, or recommends actually, a number of changes to the way the prosecution service is funded and supported in terms of legal expertise. I think what Alison said there was important. There is a level of frustration here because this did set out and was an investigation which aimed to bring people into a justice process. There were 30 files with robust evidence which were delivered to the Public Prosecution Service. So, yes, there is frustration there. And there is new information. And there is information which could have been given to families before and wasn't. And in both of those instances, these families will have access to that information. And that is, that is something which is a result of a proper investigation. Mm -hmm and wouldn't have happened without one. Alison, what, what um, is the path that Republicans have to 
walk in this. We've talked a bit about the challenge as far as the, the UK government is concerned, but we, we, we've seen Michelle O'Neill on behalf of um, the Good Friday Agreement generation, as she put it, talking uh, about her regrets, her, her, her sorrow at all of the lives that were lost during the conflict. But then you hear others, Micheál Martin and Emma Little Pengelly, the Deputy First Minister, saying that that in itself is not enough and that Republicans need to apologise and they need to accept that what they did during the Troubles was wrong. How big a challenge is that for the modern Republican movement today? The, the story of steak knife of Freddie Scapatici is incredibly difficult for Republicans and always has been right from back when we were all reporting on this back in 2003 because he operated over uh, for uh, over 13 years as an informer. He was also, if you look at the victims in this case, they're all people from very Republican families, some of them from really staunchly Republican families who could trace the Republican credentials back generations. And it, this was IRA men killing IRA men and those funerals at the time when you think about those funerals in, in West and North Belfast and the damage that caused and the pain and the hurt that that caused. And what you'd have mentioned earlier, I don't think it's been touched on enough, the stigma that those families felt. And bear in mind, I'm from West Belfast and I really understand some of those funerals, you know, they took place with just a handful of people present at them early in the morning. Um, some of those people still <clears throat> won't speak to us publicly, they'll speak to us privately, but not publicly because they still feel that kind of shame. And in one case, it actually says in Canova that when John Boucher first started investigating this, some of the family said, but if you then prosecute IRA men, will that stigma then come back on us again? Will we be targeted again? So even you know years later, that still exists. So I think in terms of Michelle O'Neill's apology, it was good that it came so quick. Mm. You know, there was no waiting around from it, you know, trying to get it out of Sinn Féin. It was prepared and it was ready to go. But I do think that there's a lot of healing to, to be done still, especially within that community that um, suffered at the hands of Freddie Scapatici. And also questions to be answered as to why there was such an effort to cover up the fact that he was an informer when he was finally unmasked. Um, Judith, what do you make of that? Alison has talked about Michelle O'Neill's apology and we saw it um, just a few moments ago um, in our coverage there. Um, what will the families make of that? And will there, will there be a strong feeling that, um, that that in itself is not enough as far as the wider Republican movement is concerned? I think it's a move in the right direction and it's a change of tone, which is important. Um, but for an apology to be meaningful, and it's been a lot of work done around this in relation to Bloody Sunday and a number of other places across the globe, you know, it needs to be specific. It needs to be given in a way which has actually been agreed with the families involved as being what they need to see. And what is said has to be what they need to be here. And also, um, it needs to be given in a place and a time and by a person that's meaning for them. So there's a lot, as a process, I think I'm saying, this is a kind of a, that kind of statement is a, is, is a look in the right direction, yeah. but it doesn't deliver the apology. And, and just to say one final thing, apology without openness and information isn't acknowledgement. The fact that there's been an investigation, that the actual facts are acknowledged and what the apology is for is absolutely clear and acknowledged is really important too. Okay, um, we need to leave it there. Thank you both very much uh, indeed <clears throat> for your thoughts. Um, let's have a first word with my guest of the day, John Manley from the Irish News. Um, what do you make of what you've just heard from Judith and Alison about the complexity, the multi-layered nature of this issue? Uh, it, it certainly, you know, the, the report, as, as people have said, didn't, I suppose, uh, give us any, especially fresh insights uh, substantively, but it, it drilled down to the detail and all those complexities and the, the wheels within wheels, as they say, of the, the dirty war. It, it raises all sorts of questions for, you know, it, it was what John Boucher, Boucher characterised as a joint enterprise between the British government and the Republican movement. So it, it puts responsibilities on both them to, to, to move this process on somehow. But that's big pressure on both the British government and on Republicans to uh, go down a road that they would not naturally comfortably want to go down. And I know that uh, Bloody Sunday, some people would say, sets a precedent as far as an apology from the UK government is concerned. It's, it's, it's not exactly the same, but it's very, very similar. But of course, for, for Republicans to say, as Emma Little Pengelly and Micheál Martin are suggesting they should say that what we did was wrong and we apologise for, opens a whole can of worms for Republicans that would undermine the whole basis of what they did during 
the troubles. I think of what Anna uh, Little Pengelly and Michal Martin are asking for is some uh, kind of apology for the entire uh, IRA campaign, which is 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 never going to come in any way. But to, to return to the specifics of the operations in informers and stake knife, I think there was a responsibility on the Republican movement in that regard. It, it's in many ways it's dealing with uh, internal housekeeping, and whether that is even a private apology or, or a Public apology, I don't know. I don't think what Michelle O'Neill, uh, Judith referred to, the, you know, the, the apology t for it to, to, to matter needs to be specific. And what Michelle O'Neill said on Friday was just too, uh, too generic. But it, it was better than what the, the British government said, which just used the cover of the fact that it was an interim report to avoid commenting. Do you think that Sinn Féin will hope that, that that will be enough and that people will move on? There's so much happening here. The political landscape has changed so dramatically. This has been published, and while we wait for the final report, Sinn Féin will be hoping the focus moves on elsewhere, presumably. Um, yes, but it, it depends. It, 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 you know, it depends whether people ask for a specific apology, and I think by broadening it, broaden it it out, uh, Michal Martin and Emma Little Pengelly in many ways let the Republican movement off the hook. Um, because th the more the demand comes from certain quarters, the more difficult yes, it is, presumably, for yes, Republicans greater, to actually the, deliver. Yes, and the greater the demand. It, 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 it sounded to me like they are looking at an apology for the entire IRA campaign, and that is not going to happen. OK. Um, we leave it there um, for now. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks again to both of you. And John, we'll speak to you a little bit later in the programme, of course. Let's turn to the Republic next, where the results of Friday's two referenda are now clear and it's been a big blow to the parties that had been campaigning for changes to be made to the constitution. Darren Marshall has sent this report from Dublin. Jubilant scenes in a packed Dublin castle as voters celebrated constitutional change after the referenda on same-sex marriage and abortion. A very different scene yesterday as Ireland said no, twice, after voters were asked if they wanted to approve amendments to the constitution around family and care. Um, as head of government and on behalf of the government, uh, we accept responsibility for the result. Uh, it was our responsibility to convince the majority of people to vote yes, um, and we clearly failed to do so. Uh, I think we struggled to convince people um, of the necessity or need for the referendum at all, uh, let alone uh, the detail and the wording. Into was the only party to campaign for a no vote. Like these two amendments by the government were an exercise in virtue signalling. This was a government flying a flag of progressiveness while actually still at the same time refusing to provide real bread and butter services to families who really need it. So just for clarity, as someone who campaigned for a no vote on both of those referenda, it is not a case that you can read this and say Ireland is more socially conservative than people may think. No, this referendum was not about uh, the conservative liberal lines that exist within society. Some people may have voted on those lines, but many, many people voted no, no, while wanting to help uh, people who were in need of care and wanting to recognise new family forms, but were just aghast at the complete lack of definition that existed in the government's um, uh, proposals. Sinn Féin supported a yes vote in both referenda. But the woman who hopes to become Ireland's first female Taoiseach said the blame lay at the door of the government. Can I just say that it's important now that people have spoken, that they're heard. Um, and I think it's a moment of reflection for the government, who uh, went on a solo run on these matters. They failed to uh, collaborate in any way. And, and they also failed to convince the electorate. Uh, bottom line is this, uh, the issue of caring and carers, the rights of people with disabilities uh, to, their, to their full rights as equal citizens, to their rights to supports and services are now absolutely centre stage. Ireland has voted no to constitutional change, but already some of the political parties here say they'll return to the issue after the next general election. The case for constitutional reform of Article 41 remains, I believe, but it won't be a matter that this government will, uh, will, 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 will be looking at again in the context of, of this term of office. It'll be a decision for a, for a future government. That election is likely to happen within the next 12 months. And only then will we know if the public and the political parties have an appetite for a fresh referendum. That was uh, Darren Marshall reporting. John Manley, what's your reading of this result in the Republic, which I think came as a bit of shock to just about everybody? 
Uh, it's it's difficult to get a handle on. Uh, there's a, there's a, uh, a poll in the Sunday Independent this morning, which you know lists numerous reasons why uh, the government's uh, bid to change the constitution changed. And it's quite a, it, it, you know, it could be regarded as quite a sort of a niche issue, but obviously it somehow uh, motivated and rallied a certain uh, anti-establishment element. And clearly, none of the not either even the opposition, as, as Mary Lou Macdonald has spelled out, even the opposition was was favoured a yes yes support so it's it's difficult to know where this uh, particular constituency that has come out in such force you know 700,000 people uh, finds a voice in in mainstream politics yeah I mean it is it is fascinating it does seem that people are now saying the government rushed the referenda there was no clarity the campaign was lackluster Leo Varadkar himself has said people frankly didn't understand because it wasn't explained to them properly why the changes were needed in the first place um, and, and there is some suggestion that the government was fixated on making sure that the referenda took place on International Women's Day rather than explaining to people what it was they were being asked to do. That's a bit of a shambles. It, it does it, you know, to uh, use the Ulster vernacular, it, is, it has been cack-handed, uh, clearly. Um, but, you know, and, and, and as I say, that it's difficult to know whether there is actual resistance to that particular constitutional change if it were framed correctly and given the right messaging. So, you know, the indica all indications are... They will run it again and they would hope to do uh, a better result. It's, a, it's a, in many ways like the Lisbon Treaty uh, referendum that they will run around until they get the right result. Yeah, well, you know, on those two votes, uh, CARE was the highest percentage no vote ever out of 38 and FAMILY was the third highest. So, you know, in terms of um, scale, it's pretty bad. Yeah. Okay. Um, John, thank you for now. Um, let's pause for a moment and turn to our occasional series, The State We're In, in which we've been hearing from some of the groups working with the most disadvantaged in our society. We'll hear from Save the Children in a moment, but first, the Simon community, which works with homeless people. My name is Conal McKenna. I'm a senior operational lead at the Simon community. At Simon Community, we provide support to some of the most vulnerable people in our society. Our mission is to end homelessness. Essentially, we're, we're trying to help people on their journey into stable, sustained housing. Uh, people who have a, a past of maybe rough sleeping, of multiple placement breakdown, being young people, of sofa surfing, of uh, accommodation breakdown, whatever it may be, we're trying to provide some stability for them in the first place. The concern recently and the frustration recently is that we have seen stagnant funding, which in real terms is equating to you know, a loss of funding year, year on year. And at that very time, we're seeing demand for our services increase exponentially, need increase exponentially, vulnerability in our society um, increase both in number and in its nature. So we've seen a doubling in the number of people registered as homeless in Northern Ireland in the last 10 years. It's currently sitting at 27, over 27,000 and that includes 4,500 children. I think that gives an idea as to the scale of the problem. We are unquestionably in the midst of a housing and homelessness crisis. Um, there's, there's, there's no doubt about that. So agencies like our own are doing our best every day, every week to try and combat that. Uh, but we need help. We, we need essentially our politicians to do the job that they were elected to do to find a way, to find solutions, to get back to the place they're supposed to be, delivering for people that need support in our society, particularly the most vulnerable people. When we have a stasis or a lack of leadership politically, we will often see that the most vulnerable in society are the people that are going to suffer the most. And I think anyone working on the front line right now can see that quite clearly every single day. My name is Laura Feeney. I'm the Senior Partnership and Practice Manager in Save the Children in Northern Ireland. Ultimately, it exists to support children to achieve their full potential in life, um, to protect them from harm and to um, alleviate the impact of poverty on their childhood. The families and children that would be available of our programmes they are finding it difficult just to provide the basic necessities for the children on a daily basis. So that can be anything from um, being able to provide food, um, being able to heat the home, being able to um, replace their children's clothing, all those sorts of things that we take for granted. Across 2023, we supported almost 2,000 children 
um, and almost about £340,000 worth of vouchers going directly into families' homes to support with those things like providing that food, um, freeing up some cash so they can ultimately heat their home or do the things that they really want to do with their children. And we just can't service the demand. It's impossible for us to, as a charity to service that demand um, because it is increasing month by month. I think in terms of children and families it's really crucial that we really put a sharp focus on tackling poverty um, and a sharp focus on actually looking at how we create a really world-class early education um, and childcare system that responds to the needs of families um, here and now um, and I'd really urge our politicians to um, roll their sleeves up get to work um, and absolutely deliver on tackling the, the rising pandemic of poverty and creating a world-class system for our children because they absolutely deserve it. Laura Feeney and Connell McKenna. Let's just have a final word with John Manley. Stormont might be back, John, but as we've just heard, these are the big challenges that need to be sorted out. Yeah, well, you, you uh, I think you began those uh, those series of uh, contributions from the third sector while the, the institutions were dormant, and uh, the, you know the sentiments that I'm hearing pretty uh, are the same as they were when we had no uh, devolution. So I think there's a sense that Stormont needs, while while things are very positive at the moment and the assembly is back, that they really need to get down to work with three years left to the mandate. So uh, you know, time is short. Yeah, and that's a big challenge. Let's talk about. Um Washington, the St. Patrick's Day celebration is a big challenge for some of our politicians because, of course, the U.S. administration's position over the Israel-Gaza conflict is, is controversial as far as some of our politicians are concerned. Some are going, some are not going. The SDLP, for example, not sending a delegation to, to Washington for St. Patrick's at all. Yes, uh, and I, I imagine that there are some within uh, Sinn Féin's base who are comfortable, uncomfortable with Sinn Féin going to Washington. It'll be interesting to see how they frame their lobbying of uh, Joe Biden uh, in, in this end. They're going there to bid for peace. Um, th given the state of things in Gaza at the moment, it would be difficult for there to be any celebratory atmosphere around uh, the White House next week. So I, th I think we'll have to keep a keen eye on those things. Um, and uh, I want to ask you a little bit, if you'd lift the lid uh, for us on... Um, your newspaper tomorrow, which has some interesting polling results from the University of um, Liverpool. What, what, what does it tell us that, um, that we maybe didn't already know? Well, the, the, the poll looks at uh, unionist, well, all attitudes to the safeguarding the union document, and we find that Geoffrey Donaldson has support for returning to Storm. OK. All right, John, got to leave it there. Thank you very much indeed. Um, that's all we've got time for today. I'll be back with The View on Thursday night at 10.40 on BBC One. For now, from all of us, thanks for watching. Bye-bye.